Hi, my name is Philippa Vincent Connolly and I'm a historian. I've studied history through the Open University and I'm looking to study disability history at two PhD level either this year or next year. And I've got a book coming out in November by Pen and Sword Books, which is called Disability and the Tudors or the King's Fools. My reason for studying disability history in particular is because I was born in 1970 at 26 weeks. I was born very early and um, because of that, I was born very small. I weighed uh, two pounds, two ounces, and therefore I was starved of oxygen at birth, which meant that I ended up with a disability, cerebral palsy. And so my interest in uh, disability history was to look at the way disabled people were treated in the past, which would then help me help to inform me on how we are now treated in the present and how we can improve things for disabled people in the future. So that was to do with my political activism and how uh, the lives of disabled people can be improved over time. So this is one of the reasons I was looking at disability history in particular. And also um, the reason why I chose the Tudors is because really it's the first era where you get good recordings and records of people with disabilities living in Tudor society so that you're able to look back and, and reference their lives and, and talk about them and see how, how they were treated. So those were the reasons why I've chosen uh, the Tudors and, and linked them with disability um, history together. And um, the other reason for studying disability history is because the topic has been so overlooked in the past that um, it's been a taboo subject where a lot of historians don't really want to um, discuss it in depth, probably because they don't want to offend people or they don't want to upset people because obviously the language used at the time to describe disabled people could be quite derogatory, especially with the Victorians and things like that as well. But um, it's you have you're almost tre treading on eggshells talking about it. So I felt that um, the best person to be able to talk about disability history is somebody who's disabled themselves, who can really understand the the subject not only from um, the experiences of the, of the past, but also from my own experiences and and be able to put it across in a much better way. And um, I think that now it's become far more fashionable for historians to look at the social side of, of disability history from any era, not just the Tudors. I mean, we can look at the Victorians and how they treated the Elephant Man, for example. We can look at um, soldiers returning injured from um, World War One and shell shock and all those kinds of aspects to right up to um, the introduction of the welfare state, Shaftesbury Society and, and all of those things linked in with disability history. So it's a huge topic to study and it's, it's very, very interesting. And regarding the Tudors, there are some distinct characters that if you go to Hampton Court Palace and you walk down the Haunted Gallery um, from the processional gallery, there is a painting which hangs adjacent to the doors into the Chapel Royal. And it's a family portrait of Henry VIII and his wife Jane Seymour and his children all around him. And of course, we all know the story of Henry VIII. We all know the story of his six wives. We all know what happened to them. Uh, it's been it's been retold and retold over the years. Um, to such a degree, but there are two other people in that port particular portrait, either side of Henry VIII, right on the edges of the painting, who are actually two disabled people who were within Henry VIII's court. And one of them in particular, if you're standing in front of the painting, he's on the right hand side of the painting under an archway, dressed in green velvet with red hose. He's got a monkey on his shoulder and the monkey looks like he's actually picking fleas and lice out of um, out of this gentleman's hair. He's obviously got the monkey as some sort of pet. And he is a gentleman called Will Summers. And he was considered to have a disability of some sort. Although it's not categorised like we would categorise disabled people today because the Tudors did not have the ability 
to be able to do that. So he could have had Down syndrome, he could have had a particular learning disability um, that was distinct to Will, and um, he was actually looked after within the Tudor court. Henry VIII um, took Will in from about 1535, we think, from the records, and he appointed Will with a carer to look after him, and this carer would have um, an allotted budget for Will, he would order clothes for Will, he would order um, a leather work for Will's horse, he would look get his horses looked after, he would make sure that Will had everything that he needed to live quite comfortably within Henry's court. And the reason for that is that Will Summer was very close to King Henry VIII. He wasn't a servant, um, not like we consider the servants of his privy um, chambers. Um, he dressed in different livery to servants, but he wasn't um, part of the nobility either. So he was very distinct in his own right in the way he dressed and the status that he occupied at court. And the reason for this is that Will Summer had the ability to make Henry laugh. He had the ability to speak the truth to Henry, regardless of what the repercussions might be. And Henry would actually listen to him and take his advice on board, especially at times when Henry was under a lot of stress. When you think about the time when Jane Seymour died, Will Summers would have been by Henry's side and supported him through that. And there were times when Henry would keep Will Summer in his apartments and talk with him and wouldn't allow access to any other courtier. So Will had a very special relationship with Henry and we can see that in uh, several other portraits that are, are um, of Henry and Will. There's one in um, Henry VIII's Psalter in his prayer book and it's got Will Summer standing quite close um, to, in the front of the painting with Henry sat behind him playing a harp looking like a bit like King David from the biblical stories. So it's it's very interesting to, to see how Henry actually took Will Summer in, looked after him and almost treated him as if he was um, a family member. And that's what's quite fascinating about Will Summer as a um, member of Henry's court. Um, sturdy beggars were um, linked to disability history. They were ex-soldiers, they were unemployed farm workers, they were old, sick and disabled people. And they would, there would be, a bit like fraudsters of the benefit system today, they would make up a disability or they would pretend to have a disability in order to claim certain benefits. In the, the Tudor period, you had sturdy beggars who would go around and pretend to be disabled play tricks on people in their towns and villages so that they could get money fraudulently to um, to obviously help themselves so they didn't have to work. So they'd be, pretend to be insane, for example, they, they were called Tom Bedlams. There were people that would pretend to be viol violently frothing at the mouth and they were called the counterfeit cranks who would try to get money off of people um, to obviously support them. And then there was a really weird name called the Clapper Dungeons who used to cut their skin to make them bleed and they'd bandage them all up and then they'd walk around and get money from passers-by. But that was sort of a minority of people because obviously if you were caught engaging in these kind of activities to fraudulently get money from people, then you would be... Um, you would be be burnt with um, a branding iron and you would have a symbol on you to um, show that you'd done that and then you'd either go to um, prison for a couple of years or they would pass you on to the next village where you would have to go and get a job. But the majority of disabled people were either cared for by their families or if families couldn't support their disabled relatives, then the monasteries would take over and support people with disabilities and get them to work within the monasteries so that they would be well cared for and looked after. There was also almshouses as well, which would take disabled people in to care for them too. So the Tudors were very um, apt at um, looking after people that um, were at the bottom of the pile in society and had a system where 
charitable monies were given. You'd have um, philanthropists who would take in people with disabilities, um, people with Down syndrome and things like that, and have them as family members, a bit like Henry VIII did with um, Will Summer, and they'd try and educate them and look after them and dress them, feed them, all those kinds of things. Thomas More was um, well known for having a fool living with him called Henry Pattinson, who, who he actually um, took with him on many of his European trips and also you know, they would debate different issues of the day and um, Henry Patterson was at, I would actually advise Thomas More as well and the, that's in the records too. So those are the sorts of pl places that disabled people actually um, were looked after in society by um, well-known noble families, by their own families and then if that failed then they would be in the monasteries or in almshouses worst comes to the worst they, they would be homeless they would be trying to raise money through charitable means and and alms giving and things like that um so those are the kinds of places that would help disabled people and the almshouses and hospitals might be on the edge of towns and cities the cities like Norwich, London, obviously, there were specific hospitals for people who had mental disabilities like um, Bedlam Hospital, but um, they didn't have a great deal of space for, for many inmates. So you would be advised to look after your relative in your own home if you, you could and seek as much support from from um, doctors and surgeons and barber surgeons if you could afford it. So again, like it is today, it's all down to money, whether you can afford to have carers coming in and look after you, whether you had benefactors and things like that. So that's basically how disabled people lived. And what I found really interesting about the Tudors is that they were quite advanced in their attitudes um, towards disabled people. And in some instances, they actually treated them better than disabled people are treated today, I think, because... They were treated as equal, they weren't, they weren't labelled, they were looked after, they were cared for. You know, it was, that was quite a revelation to me, really. And that's why I enjoyed writing the book so much. And the other reason why I enjoyed um, writing the book was because in later life, Henry VIII actually owned three wheelchairs and he had a um, system sort of like a stair lift if you like at Whitehall Palace which would get him up 26 steps um, in the palace and it would be like a lever and pulley system so he had um, mobility aids to help him get around as he got more and more, more obese and he suffered more and more with the ulcers that kept opening up after his jousting accident on the 24th of January 1536 and he just became more and more disabled over time he would try and keep his disability um, to a minimum. He wouldn't allow his courtiers to see him being pushed around in a wheelchair. There would only be a few people quite close to him who would, would see that. He had walking canes with whistles on. So if he fell over, he was able to blow a whistle and summon somebody to help him get up. But knowing with Henry's size, he'd probably need three or four courtiers to, to help him off the floor. Um, and he also had like a... Um, a lifeline like a life support thing that we have today for elderly people when they fall over in their own homes that they can alert somebody to come from um, a care situation and get them up off the floor henry had like a, a megaphone where he would shout to his courtiers who were beyond his private chambers and sort of say i've fallen over come and help get me up and so i found, <laughs> found that really really interesting um, so yeah, but you'll be able to read more about that in the book when that comes out in November, which I'm really looking forward to um, to doing. So, um, what's next for me? Well, at the moment, I've got a um, book that I've well, I've got a series of books which I've been working on for the past four or five years called um, Timeless Falcon, which is about a um, history student in the modern era in our times who actually manages to time travel back to Tudor England 
and she finds herself in Hever Castle and how she actually ingratiates herself with the Boleyn family and the dilemma she has about whether she should change history, stop Anne being executed, stop Henry and Anne marrying. Um, that's about, uh, the whole thing is about 300,000 words long. Um, so it's it's been split up into a trilogy series and I've just finished volume one of that and I'm self-publishing that at the moment. have been trying to get an agent, but um, it's quite difficult to get fiction published. Um, and then next, my next project, which I'm working in on in while well, we're all locking down in isolation because of the COVID-19 virus, is I'm working on a book for Pen and Sword again with um, disability history to do with the Victorians. So I'm looking at how the Victorians treated people with disability, um, the Elephant Man freak shows, all those sorts of things. So it's delving into disability history again, but much later on and looking at how attitudes have changed from the Tudor period to the Victorian period. But I think I'm going to be quite shocked at what I find with how the Victorians treated um, disabled people in comparison to the Tudors. So, um, and that should be coming out within sort of the next two years. And obviously um, wanting to get on with a PhD in disability history, which I'm starting to write applications for and um, looking into how I can move forward academically as a historian, how I can improve my writing and my critical thinking. So um, that's that's what I'm looking forward to doing to doing next. So I really hope that you found this video informative and I wish you all the best as we continue to self-isolate. Thank you very much.